they say that our people perish because of lack of knowledge. But in the year 2022, I think the second part of that holds even more true. And that is we perish because we reject that knowledge. We reject the knowledge because the knowledge is around us everywhere. Even in the cell phones that we carry. That cell phone carries so much information and it's all about what you choose to do with that cell phone. Whether you choose to scroll Facebook and look at funny things on TikTok or if you choose to read, research, study. Information is right there in the palm of our hands. So if you have it and you're not reading and you're not studying, you're not learning, then that means that you are rejecting. So we reject that knowledge. But about 12 years ago, we decided to start a book club. And in the book club, one of our very first books that we ever read, actually, actually this was the second book. The first book being The Science of Getting Rich. Very good book. I advise anybody to read it. Very short read. Very good book. But the second book that we ever read, and by far to me, was the best book. The very best book. And that's called The Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill. If you never read the book, then let me give you the story behind this book. And this will help you to understand why I say it's the best book I've ever read in my life. So, go back to the early 1900s. There was a guy named Napoleon Hill. At the time, he was a people analyzer. His job was to analyze people, you know, to help them to see what kind of person that they were. And one day, he got a chance to interview Andrew Carnegie. At the time, Andrew Carnegie, he was the second richest man in the world. But he got a chance to interview Andrew Carnegie. And... Andrew Carnegie took a liking to Napoleon Hill so much that he, he said, I'm going to give you a job for the next year. I'm not going to pay you any money other than your food, room, and travel. But for the next year, I'm going to introduce you to some of my richest friends. Some of those people being like Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin. He said, I'm going to introduce you to these people. And I want you to study them. I want you to study them and learn how do they think? How do us rich people think? What make the rich rich? And he did that. He said, this job is going to last you for one whole year. One whole year. It actually ended up lasting for about 10 years. But at the end of the time span, at the end of the time span, Andrew Carnegie told him, I want you to take what you learn and put it in a book. Now keep in mind, these people were Andrew Carnegie's friend. So, they were open with Napoleon Hill. Very open. Very open. So he got a chance to study them. Talk to them. Intimate conversations about, about the difference in how the rich think and how the poor think. Or how the middle class think. So at the end of the 10 years, he took what he learned and he put it in a book. He wrote, he printed 117 copies of this book. He took the book. And he sent it to some of those people whom he had interviewed, Thomas Edison, Jay Rockefeller, all those people. And when they read, because he wanted to approve of that, what he learned from studying them over the years was, in fact, correct in his book. He sent the copies to them. They read it. They sent it back to Napoleon Hill. They said, no, you cannot produce this book. This book is not for the masses. The information in this book that you got written is only for the elite, for the rich. You need to water it down. So he had to water it down. He watered this book down about three or four times. About three or four times over the course of about seven years. Until finally, finally, that last copy that he sent them, they read. They said, yes, you can produce this book. This book you can produce to the masses. The name of that book in 1932, the name of that book was called Think and Grow Rich. Many of you may have read it. You may like it. You may have got a lot out of the book. But just remember, that was the book that they approved that he could print for the masses. That was around 1932. Don't get me too exact on these dates, but back around 1932. Fast forward 70 years. The year 2002. There was this guy. He was in an old antique bookstore. And he came across this copy of one of the original manuscripts, one of the original prints that Napoleon had did in 1925. He bought that copy for $20,000. He bought it for $20,000. And in 
He verified with the uh, with the Napoleon Hill Foundation that yes, indeed, it was one of the authentic copies that Napoleon had written. He took that copy, he bought the rights to it, and he put it in a book. The laws of success. Some people may call it the 15 laws of success, but it's called the laws of success. There's a few different variations of the book from 1925. This one called the Laws of Success. This is the original copy. Another one may be called the 15 Laws of Success. That was one from like 1927. But this is the original copy, the Laws of Success. It is unedited. It, it, it's unedited in, in a way. This is the raw version of the book. This is the book that you want to read. And the reason why that you want to read this book because it's more like a, a character building book. He, now it does have 15 laws in here. So he starts with law number one, chapter one, called definite purpose. If you all have read Think and Grow Rich, then that very first chapter is called A Definite Chief Aim. That's the watered down version. This book is called The Laws of Success. The first chapter is called A Definite Purpose. The way that Napoleon Hill describes a definite purpose is like a ship, big ship. At the back of the ship, it has a rudder. The rudder is what controls the direction of the ship. If the captain turns the rudder left, then the ship go right. If he turns the rudder right, then the ship go left. But that controls the direction of the ship. So take this big ship and put it in the middle of the water. If that sh It doesn't matter how much gas, how strong the engine is. If that ship does not have a rudder, or if it has a broken rudder, the ship is going to go around and around and around in circles until it run out of gas, until it exhausts itself, and then end up sitting in the middle of the water, can't go anywhere else. Your life without a definite purpose is like that ship without a rudder. It's gonna go around, around, around the circles of life till you get to be about the age 55, 60, 60 years old. Then you look back and like, I've done a lot. I did a lot, or at least I feel like it. But I haven't been in the world. I don't have anything to show for it. I didn't build anything. I don't have any foundation. I don't have nothing but to say I have fun. You gotta get, you gotta have a definite purpose about your life. Because without it, your life is gonna be like that ship in the middle of the water. It's gonna go around, 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 around circles until you can't go anymore. Definite purpose. Like I said, like I said, this is a character building book from chapter one all the way up to chapter 15. Chapter two in the book is called uh, self-confidence. Self-confidence. Whatever you're doing, you got to be confident in what you can do. Can't go through life always doubting yourself like you can't do something. Whether man can do something or not, he's right. So if you believe that you can do something, then more than likely you can get it done. But the moment that you believe that you can't do it, no, you can't get it done. So you got to have some kind of confidence, self-confidence about your life. The third chapter of the book is called Imagination. Imagination. Back when we was kids, everybody had a vivid imagination. At first, you said that you wanted to be the president of, of the United States. We used in the sixth grade. Got into the eighth grade, then you said, well, I just want to be rich. Got to the tenth grade, then you just want to have a good job. Get to the twelfth grade, you just want a career. And it's like... The older that we get, the less of a of an imagination that we have. All the way to the point of, uh, I just want to make a living. No. No, you were destined to do more than just make a living. Just to make a living? No, you want to live. You want to live a great life. But you got to have some kind of imagination. Everything, everything that you see around you that's created, everything around you was first in somebody's imagination. Somebody, the airplane... The airplane. Sorry about that. I got cut off. But the Rice brothers didn't just uh, accidentally invent the airplane. No. They had it in their imagination first. Then it came into fruition. Then it came into fruition. Just like a dream. Dreams don't come true unless you have a dream. Imagination, guys. The third chapter of the book is called Leadership and Initiative. Actually, I got those uh, switched up. Actually, Leadership Initiative is the third chapter. Leadership and Initiative. It takes more. It takes more than just doing what you're told to do. you got to learn to take the initiative. 
you gotta learn to take the initiative. That's doing something that you're supposed to do even without even without somebody always telling you to do it. You gotta learn to take the initiative. That's how leaders are made. That's how leaders are made. They learn to take the initiative. So the chapter is called Initiative and Leadership. When it comes to leadership, if you ever want to be a great person, then you got to learn how to lead. You got to learn how to lead other people. But, but before you can lead other people, you got to learn how to lead yourself in the right direction. Leadership and initiative. Now, the fifth chapter of the book is called Action. Action. You got to learn to take action. The opposite of action is procrastination. Everybody say that they're going to do something, but don't ever do it, okay? You got three birds sitting on the fence. If three of those birds decide to fly away, how many birds are left sitting on the fence? i wait. <laughs> you got three birds sitting on the fence. If three of those birds decide to fly away, how many birds do you have sitting on the fence? You still got three. Why? Just because those three birds decided to fly away does not mean that they're going to fly away. Just because you decide that you're going to do something don't mean that you're going to do it. Many of us, we decide to do things all day long, but we never do them. We procrastinate. Got to learn to take action. Action, action, action. Chapter number six called Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Oh, enthusiasm is, it's, it's like that fuel in your car. Don't matter how strong that the engine is, how fast it is, how beautiful that the car look. If it don't have any gas, then you're not going anywhere. That enthusiasm is what drives us. Enthusiasm will have you working to the wee hours, to the wee mornings, just doing work, studying, grinding, doing your craft. You might not eat, you might not sleep, but that enthusiasm will drive you. You got to have enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. And if you're passionate about whatever that you're doing, then you're going to automatically have that enthusiasm, but you got to have that passion. Because when you enjoy doing the doing certain work, it don't become work anymore. It don't become work anymore because you enjoy it. Enthusiasm. The next chapter of the book is called uh, The Habit of Doing More for Less. Okay? That's just simply perfect, perfect example. Under promise, over deliver. Under promise, over deliver. Okay? If somebody pay me for a job, I'm going to make sure I do exactly what I say I'm going to do. I even might even downplay it some, but I'm going to always do more. I'm going to always give the person, the customer, the client more. Always give them more. And some people only want to do just enough. That's what makes us or some of us stay employees all of our life because we're only willing to do just enough work to keep from getting fired. So therefore, your boss pays you just enough money to keep you from quitting. When you learn to do more than the work that you're paid for, somewhere down the line, someone important is going to see that, they're going to recognize that, and you will get compensated for it. You could get a raise for it. You get promotion for it. You get put into a position to do bigger and better things. Why? Because you were willing to do more than what you was actually paid for. Go on to the next chapter called self-control when he talk about self-control he's not talking about controlling your actions or control what you do he's talking about control what you think about control what you think about this is what makes man the apex predator simply because man is the only species the only species on this planet that can think now let me rephrase that because even a dog can think Birds could think, okay? A gorilla could think. But man is the only species on the earth that can control what he thinks about. Man is the only species on this earth that can control what he thinks about. That is what makes him the apex predator. Because after all, you become what you think about the most. So when you choose to think about bullshit all your life, about doing about beating people, cheating people, deceiving people, that that's the kind of person that you're going to become. And you choose to do these things. You choose these thoughts. But how about if you start choosing good? You choose to help people. You, help to, you choose to help lift and elevate other people. 
bring them to a higher station in life. You got the power to choose what you think about. You got that power. The next chapter in the book is called Accurate Thought. Accurate Thought. Now, I'm going to stop right here because everybody needs to actually read the book for themselves, okay? But these are some of the laws in the book. Accurate Thought. You got Concentration. You got Tolerance. You also have the golden rule. All these are chapters in the book. These are character building. These are character building chapters. It really changed our lives when we started the book club and we started reading the laws of success. I advise anybody, go online, order this book. If you can, find the 1925 version. If you can't find the 1925 version, you can get the 1928 version that has a special introduction chapter in it that's very, very good. If you can't find that one, I could email you that introductory chapter. It's about 145 pages. It's not in this original book, but it's in the 1928 version. And when I say that that introduction to the book is very, very powerful, oh, everybody needs to read it. Everybody needs to read it. But yes, y'all, we don't just simply perish because we lack knowledge. We perish because we reject that knowledge. We don't want to pick up books and read them. Yeah, I won't admit. I'll admit. This book right here is over a thousand something pages. Yes, it's, it intimidated me when I first saw it because I had never read a book this thick. But when you get to reading this book, you get so caught up into, you get so engulfed in the information that's in the book that you can't even put it down. And actually, after you get through reading all the chapters in the book, you're going to be wishing that you had some more other book to read. But go get this book, The Laws of Success, one of the best books that we've ever read in our book club. I, I, I believe that this is the foundation of all the books that we ever read, personal development-wise. We read several, several personal development books. Then we moved on over to the business books, and we'll talk about some of those on down the line. The Laws of Success, if you haven't read it, get it. If you read Think and Grow Rich, that's fine, but you still need to read this. This is the true copy. This is the true version. This is the book that they did not want us to read.